Good afternoon and welcome to another edition of the WARF Essential Topics series. My name is Laura Heisler and I'm Director of Programming for the Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation and we are delighted to bring you this series from time to time on issues and topics that are important to members of the UW-Madison and Madison communities and broader communities when it comes to understanding technology commercialization. Uh, today's session is going to be a little bit different than our normal one because we have two major things we're going to accomplish. We're going to be talking about stories of innovation across that whole hour. And the first portion, about the first 35 minutes, will be a more typical session and a conversation led by my colleague Jennifer Gottwald, Director of Licensing at Wharf, and some inventors and entrepreneurs. Um, and a little bit more than halfway through, we're going to transition and hear from Chief Intellectual Property and Licensing Officer Michael Falk about the Wharf Innovation Awards and meet this year's Wharf Innovation Awards winners. So we have a two part thing to round out the year. Just a couple more notes. We are recording this session. You'll be able to find the video at wharf.org tomorrow. And um, we do, certainly do wanna field your questions as we always do at Wharf Essential Topics. We'll be fielding them as part of the first portion and we'll be rounding that out and, and finishing that up at about 35 minutes after the hour. So I'll send out a little reminder to you that you can ask your questions at any time during that first portion of today's session. We field your questions using the Q&A function which you can find by mousing over your tool tab. And you can ask your question at any time and we'll do our best to get to it. So with that, I'm gonna move things along and turn the podium over to my colleague, Jennifer Gottwald, Director of Licensing at Wharf, to moderate the first portion of today's session. Jennifer, over to you. Thanks so much, Laura. Welcome everybody. I'm really excited to have this conversation here today. Uh, you might have been uh, sat in on a Wharf Essential Topics last month where my colleague Beth Werner talked to Professor Jenny Gumpers about patenting inventions, kind of um, the nuts and bolts of how to disclose your invention to Wharf and what we do with it. And then Jenny talked about her experience. Jenny is one of the Wharf Innovation Award finalists as are my guests today. We have uh, Professor David Plant and Professor Reed Alish, along with Matt Ber um, Berg, who's the CEO and co-founder of Somni. I'll get more to them in a moment, and we're going to talk about how these other Innovation Award finalists are already collaborating with a company that we hope can um, bring their product to the market after um, some years of development here. So with that, I am going to... Um, play a short video where David and Reed are going to explain their technology and what they want to do with it. Hi, I'm Jennifer Gobbled, a licensing director at WARF. And I'm IP manager Victoria Sutton. For the 2020 WARF Innovation Awards, we're pleased to nominate Drs. David Plant and Reed Alish for their work to better understand and quantify sleep. In collaboration with the company partner, the test they are developing would be the first of its kind. It could not only help to identify and treat sleep disorders, it could also be used for occupational safety and to promote healthy lifestyles. Congratulations, David and Reed. We're excited to see you take this technology to the next level. Hi, I'm David Plant. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry, and I'm the medical director at Wisconsin Sleep. Sleep is a really important aspect of all of our lives. We spend about a third of our lives sleeping and it plays a key role in our overall health. One of the challenges in studying sleep uh, is the ability to measure it. And usually we have to rely on very complicated and expensive uh, laboratory tests uh, that use brainwave activity to measure whether or not someone is asleep. So what this technology fundamentally does is it tries to use uh, an easily accessible um, sample, saliva, to estimate the amount of sleep people are getting at night and also how sleepy they are during the day, uh, and to do so using changes in uh, genetic expression. We start with saliva and we extract DNA to monitor an epigenetic modification that is found on the DNA. This epigenetic modification uh, is variable and it's related to the amount of sleep that a person needs. We have a real opportunity here to take a, an accessible tissue and very quickly determine the level of sleep that an individual needs or the level of sleep that that individual has been getting. And we can relate this to the health outcomes of that individual. So we're very excited about 
further advancing this technology because it has really immense implications uh, for a lot of different industries. So being able to identify how much sleep someone is getting or how much sleep they need has a lot of very practical implications, both for healthcare, because sleep is such an important part of our, our overall health, and also occupational settings, where knowing how much sleep someone is getting before they operate uh, a motor vehicle or an airplane, for example, is really key uh, to keeping everyone safe. Really, my hope for this technology is that it will be um, a game changer uh, in the practice of sleep medicine. I'm a sleep medicine physician, uh, and I really think that it's important for us to try to advance our field uh, to care for what is really an, an unmet need uh, in our overall health uh, and, and healthcare. So, so I think having this technology that would be widely available uh, and easy to use, it really could make caring for patients both in the sleep clinic and then in other settings, uh, much better. Excellent, thanks. Uh, it's a fun experience to see yourself on a video while you're on Zoom, isn't it? So uh, congratulations to Reed and David for being finalists in the Wharf Innovation Awards. You'll hear about the other four finalists um, after our discussion here. So I'll just kick this off a little bit. David, you talked a bit in this um, video about current measurements of sleep, it seems like a very simple thing, but that it's really kind of cumbersome, doesn't always give you the best results, is expensive. Can you just tell us a little bit about how you currently do these measurements in the sleep clinic or as a physician and what we need to make these better? Sure, so we have a lot of different ways to uh, measure sleep. So the easiest way is just to go out and ask somebody, you know, how much sleep did you get last night or do you get on average? The problem is that estimate is usually pretty inaccurate. So people aren't very good at estimating their sleep and it's not for sake of trying, but I think it's really challenging because you're asking people to sort of measure an, an activity when they're unconscious. So they're not really aware of what's going on anyway. So it's oftentimes a, a little bit off. And then in the clinical setting, um, we have a couple of different ways to try to measure or estimate sleep. So one is with something called actigraphy that, that uses accelerometry. So it's got a, um, something that's similar to what may be in your Fitbit that measures rest activity patterns. The problem with that too, is it doesn't really measure sleep. What it does is it measures whether you're moving or not. And so it doesn't really give us an accurate enough window a lot of the times to understand how much sleep people again are really getting. And the, the best way, the most accurate way to measure someone's sleep is to, to put them in the sleep lab where we put a lot of monitors on them, uh, measuring brain waves uh, and other monitors. And, and we basically estimate how much they're sleep using gold standard technologies. The problem is it's very, very expensive and it's also not a typical night for people. So we've got all these sensors on them. They usually don't sleep all that well. And oftentimes we can't let people sleep longer than they normally do uh, in the lab because it's, it's complicated with changes of shift and technicians and those kinds of things. So actually estimating the amount of sleep people are getting accurately uh, and using a simple measure uh, is a real challenge uh, clinically. That's great. Okay, so you wanted to find a better way to measure sleep and read. You work um, on uh, various things about um, markers, markers, biomarkers within the human body. Can you explain how you got connected to David in this project and what you were trying to do with it? Sure. Uh, so my group is really focused on finding objective molecular markers for human health. And when I met with David, he told me about the problem that um, he was experiencing in terms of this more subjective uh, measurement. Uh, he also told me that he had a really unique group of individuals that had, were unmedicated and had unexplained hypersomnolence, um, meaning their amount of sleep that they would need was, 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 was much, much greater than, than the average person. He told me about this great need for trying to determine the sleep need and the sleep uh, that people were getting. And we felt that together we had a real opportunity here to identify a more objective marker of sleep and sleep duration. Great, thank you. So um, you both came to Wharf and you told us about your invention. You found some epigenetic markers of sleep as you explained in the video. And at that point, we're going to introduce uh, Matt Berg here. So 
Matt, can you tell us a little bit about your company, Somni, and how you became aware of Reed and David's work? Yeah, uh, and thanks for uh, putting this on, Jennifer, and having having us here. Um, yeah, so the, the the backstory here is 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 one of somewhat serendipity. Um, you know, our company, Somni, is a is a digital health company uh, in Madison, and we're focused on on sleep, uh, specifically making uh, long term meaningful improvements to folks who are um, what we would somewhat label as sleep desperate or 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 really struggling to to make change to their sleep. Um, and we've been working on this problem now for several years, and we typically work with organizations uh, to, to deploy this to their employees. And uh, a longstanding challenge, and, and just sort of um, dovetailing off of what David said, is this uh, problem of tracking sleep accurately. And so we typically will use commercially available devices, um, Apple Watch, Fitbit, things like that. Um, unfortunately, there's just inherent error in these devices, and you're never really truly getting um, you know, sort of data that you can rely on always. And for us, it's really not pragmatic to, to put someone in a lab overnight for what we're doing. And um, sort of, so this is a couple of years ago, a, a colleague we used to work for who, who now is at Wharf um, remembered actually this problem we, we've, or this challenge, excuse me, we've been dealing with over the years and, uh, and, 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 you know, thought to connect us with uh, Reed and David's work. Well, actually sort of with you first, Jennifer, um, and so it gave us a chance to, to look, look at the research and, and get to know uh, David and Reed. And it was just sort of like this, this, you know, almost like too perfectly, you know, it was almost too good to be true, sort of falling in our lap in the sense of like, we have this, this real challenge in terms of our sort of behavioral health program that we, that we offer in terms of being able to track someone's progress over time. You know, that's a, that's a big component of this to be able to show that this is working or not. Um, there's a whole bunch of other things we want to do with the, ultimately with the data, but you know, for us to, to have a more reliable, precise um, way to track someone's sleep as they go through our uh, behavioral medicine program is is uh, is very important. And so, uh, just you know, it we couldn't be you know sort of more thrilled to be be able to participate in this work and and uh, and that's sort of the, the sort of the origin story, if you will. So um, yeah, I, I guess it's one of somewhat luck on our part um, <laughs> that we we uh, we stumbled into this, if you will. But we're we're happy to be at the table. Uh, suffice to say, so. Great. So, and I know um, my colleague, Neil um, Lay, who first um, told me about Somni and introduced me to you, this was very, very, very early on. I think um, some of you out there who may be Wharf inventors are thinking, well, I disclosed something a couple of years ago, and I don't think companies are interested in it yet. That's um, pretty normal. Wharf goes through a lot of uh, marketing on technologies, but we're also looking for when your papers are going to publish, and you presented at a few conferences. You're the experts and lend credibility to your technology, so that's kind of sometimes the... Um, the impetus we get to start marketing to companies. This was something that um, Reed and David had just kind of um, found out about, got the data to the point where they thought we should go talk to Wharf about it. So Matt, I know at first I was a bit um, maybe frustrating to you in that I couldn't tell you the details until we had filed a patent application and we put you under a confidentiality agreement. I don't remember how long that took, but I know we had some good discussions in there about how, kind of how wharf works and what might happen and did you understood that the reason for a bit of delay but i was super excited that we had a company interested that early so we got the the patent application filed and then we got a confidentiality agreement in place and then matt i think um we set up a big meeting where you could meet david and reed so maybe all three of you can just kind of talk about how you started this discussion Let's, okay, Reed, you're good. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was, um, you know, it was, it was, it felt organic. I mean, we didn't know um, anything about Somni, and we wouldn't probably know anything about Somni if it weren't for, for Jennifer and, and Worf to introduce Matt and his, his group to us. And, um, you know, really from the beginning, it was uh, sort of just it just made sense. I mean, everything that Matt described uh, were challenges that we were trying to overcome in in David's sleep lab as well. And you know, the, the data that David and I, uh, you know, have generated, you know, although you know, in the beginning stages and, and preliminary, they they really suggested that it could help in this situation. 
So um, we were really excited about the opportunity of, of, of sort of teaming up with a group like Somni and, and to really test our invention sort of in the open waters, if you will, you know, in, in a group of individuals that, you know, like I said, David had a really, you know, unique and ideal collection of individuals that allowed us to have the signal to find, uh, you know, epigenetic marks and, and their um, sort of their, their levels of, of, of epigenetic marks um, in relation to sleep. But now we wanted to really test, you know, in a much bigger group of individuals that, you know, not everything's perfectly aligned and we really wanted to see how well our technology would work. And so Somni and Matt, um, you know, since day one, they've been really on board with giving it a try and, and helping us, um, you know, make that a reality. Yeah, and I'd also say that uh, there's a lot of patients, you know, I want to thank Matt and also Worf, you know, for, uh, I can't speak for Reed, but my naivete about the whole process, right? I mean, I'm sort of new to the whole um, uh, process of, of disclosing to Worf and filing patents and those kinds of things, but it's been really nice and, and uh, it's been, uh, like Reed said, kind of a very organic discussion. You know, we don't always know exactly where we're going uh, with, with these things. Um, um, that's part of discovery, I think. So, you know, it's really exciting to be able to um, have the potential to collect uh, data and, and samples and collaborate with, with people outside of academia. I think it's very easy to sort of get, you know, lost in an ivory tower sometimes around the things that we do or, or invent or study. And so it's really nice to, you know, have a, a little bit more real world perspective to see if these things, you know, really do, you know, pan out and, and where the rubber meets the road, I think is really important. So it's been it's been really helpful, I think, to get those perspectives and also just to learn about sort of how all these things work uh, in the real world. Uh, I mean, we're so, I think, uh, into you know, writing grants and, and doing research that it's, it's very easy to get lost uh, in all of the other work uh, that, that really goes into something to make it, you know, usable to, to the broader population and really have a, a, a translational impact. So I think it's been, it's been great working with Matt and with Worf on this whole process. Yeah, and um, just to uh, share some words on that, you know, I think, um, yeah, organic is, is definitely the the sort of the right word, but it, it also just felt like we're, we're, we're all working towards the same problem and just sort of um, on, on slightly different paths. And I, I think that's why it's felt so, you know, like, how do we how do we bring them into the into the fold of this? And how do we team team up with with Reed and David since, you know, from day one, it, it just felt so natural. Um, and they've they've been fantastic to work with, and and uh, Jennifer, you as well. I, I've I've interfaced with um, you know tech transfer offices before Somni in, in other capacities, and, and I have to say that this this whole experience has been so smooth and um, as enjoyable as, as it can be. You know, in terms of uh, sort of going through the the, the the process, it's it's you know nothing but good things to say. And, and particularly, I want to emphasize around like uh, thinking about long term partnership. You know, because I think the reality is, and um, I know you know David and Reed and I have sort of sort of touched on this, but this is going to take a while, um, you know, no matter what happens, you know, there's going to be, you know, you know, as you sort of wander and invent, you know, sort of David dis in the discovery process, there's, there's, there's time that, that happens and there's, um, you know, sort of you're, you're swinging the bat and, and taking shots and you're not always sure where they're going to land. And so I think from the beginning, there's been this great um, spirit of, of long-term partnership, which we so much appreciate here. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, and I think part of this is it, it's made it even easier from from early. So sort of day one to get involved and, and say, you know, how do we how do we participate here and help sort of uh, invent the future? You know, I think for us, um, at least from our perspective, it's it's so clear how, you know, the next decades coming with, uh, you know, this intersection between sort of genetics, you know, software and, and health are going to play a huge role in everyone's lives. And to the extent that we can play in that space. Um, you know, to build tool sets that that ultimately, you know, improve health and, and uh, unlock value for our customers. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're thrilled to do that. And I, th I think this tool that Reed and David have, have created um, has, has immense potential for, for just that, you know, this ability to, you know, there's, there's, there's monitoring applications, but then there's also very practical sort of, um, uh, sort of even, you know, edge cases that are, they're even more more direct in terms of what this could become from a health standpoint. So uh, there's there's so much here that you know we're just scratching the surface. And so I think I think 
positioning this and setting this thing up for, you know, I, I thought about this a lot, you know, in preparation for today is, is how do we, you know, Jennifer, I think our conversation has been so rooted on um, setting the foundation for a long-term partnership. Again, just, we're so thankful for that and, and to be partnered with Reed and David on this, on this great effort. I'll echo that back too, Matt. And I think that's an important thing here at Wharf and our whole process of inventions at universities and moving them out into the marketplace. We know that everything that happens at the university, I mean, by virtue of why we have such um, great professors and great research is it's cutting edge, it's brand new. You get the data to um, convince your peer reviewers that this is something real and can get published. That's not necessarily how things go when they're developed within industry. There's more of a luxury of taking time to get more data and prove more things out. So Wharf understands and our inventors understand and our licensees understand that we're entering into something pretty risky early stage. And we're hoping everybody sees long-term potential and we want that long-term potential to come to fruition. So we need to work together collaboratively, kind of sharing that risk in order to make that happen, which is great. Um, what uh, was surprising, Reed and David, can you tell us a little bit about if you have worked with industry before or not? And um, what surprised you about um, working with Matt, talking to him and meeting other people in Somni and um, figuring out a collaborative plan for going forward? Reed, do you want to, I guess I'll go ahead and feel that. I mean, so I've, I've worked with industry, but not in this type of capacity. So, you know, I usually the capacity that I've worked with industry or interface with them has been um, in my role as sort of a, a physician uh, and sort of um, some expertise in, in sleep disorders uh, and, and sort of providing, you know, consultant type of inf uh, feedback to companies about either uh, studies that they're developing, those kinds of things, because I have a background uh, in, in clinical investigation. So my interface with industry has always been on that type of level. It's always been sort of how can I help, like, how can I help them, you know, advance whatever they're doing, but usually on a consultant level. I've never really been involved in this way where it's something that, you know, I'm really invested in, where this is something that I care a great deal about. Like it's, it's the area, it's the, it's the patients that I take care of. It's the, the field that I, I care about that I've sort of dedicated my, my life to trying to, to sort of help uh, and advance. So it's, it's a lot more exciting for me uh, in that kind of sense. So, so really having the opportunity to be invested in this particular technology uh, early on and upfront, you know, I think is the biggest difference for me. Yeah, and I would only add to um, just the interactions that we've had with Somni and, and some of their, um, their team. And, you know, I don't know if, uh, I think you would use the word surprising. I don't know if it was surprising, but um, it was really eye-opening. Um, it was eye-opening how much, you know, they wanted to learn from us and, and really about the specifics of sort of the, um, you know, the molecular specifics. You know, I didn't expect everyone would, would have known that going in, but, but they were very sort of thirsty to learn more about it and then to figure out how they could sort of help us. So help us, which in turn helps them. And so that's where the teamwork really, you know, really showed itself to me. Um, their enthusiasm for our work, you know, I, I think I remember one of, of, of Matt's colleagues saying, wow, this is really cool. And, you know, that was exciting for us to see because of course we think it's really cool, but, you know, for, for other people who, who don't think about um, sort of epigenetics or, you know, you know, genetics in general, or, or maybe even some of the sleep duration stuff that, that David's focused on, it, it was, they, they found it really fascinating. And I think reflective, you know, reflective on how they view themselves and how they view um, how they would, you know, um, um, uh, they would get gain something from this technology and, and actually help themselves personally and then how it would help in the greater population. So it was really exciting just to see how um, in some ways there were groups, there was, there was colleagues that are on some of these calls that, that really haven't thought deeply about sort of the molecular component of this. And so for me, that was really exciting to, to share that with them and see their excitement. And, and that excitement sort of, it, it was really great for our, for our meetings in terms of what are the next steps. Great, thanks. And Matt, I know 
I was impressed in early looking into Somni that you are, um, you definitely take um, a basis in science. And I know when I first spoke to you and as uh, Reed and David have said, um, you're interested in the science around the sleep. You wanna apply the science best to the um, products and services that Somni is offering. So can you talk just a little bit about where do you best access that science? What, um, what you know, I, you've said, and I, uh, um, appreciate that, that it was a good experience accessing um, this university um, and through WARF in order to um, see some brand new science that you might be able to add to your products. Can you talk a little bit about why that science is important and how it uh, does add value to your company? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, so if we, if we zoom out and we look at this from Sort of, a, sort of a 30,000 foot level. Uh, one of our, our efforts is to um, is really have an evidence, evidence-based program first. And so I, what we mean by that is when someone comes to Somni and goes through uh, one of our behavioral medicine programs that we can measure that they've had meaningful change. And so uh, there's a lot of ways you can do that, but at the, at the simplest level is, is like, are they sleeping more and is that sleep quality improved? Um, so, and to that, to, to, our, to our sort of efforts uh, in that goal, we, we try to use best practice um, sort of research and literature to, to drive that around sort of um, turning the different sort of uh, knobs and variables that control sleep um, that, that a human has control over. And so um, that, that's sort of where we come at it from, from our lens. But, you know, you know, when we met Reed and David, sort of this, this you know, when you meet sort of researchers and scientists, um, as world-class as they are, you know, I think what becomes like very clear that, um, you know, being able to sort of uh, utilize uh, some of the, the great work that they've done and, and incorporate that into what we're already doing um, just became a really a, a no-brainer. And so, you know, going forward, we're, we're going to try, you know, to do, or we're, we're going to do it the best we can above board science to try and publish, um, you know, our findings as we go forward. Um, so, you know, we can share with the world. I know that's something we, we both have, you know, mutual interest in. But, you know, I think our, the reasons we come at are slightly different, but ultimately just to be able to show to people that this does work and that, um, uh, you know, you can use it in sort of a predictable and reliable manner. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so, so I think accessing the science uh, through WARF is, has been, you know, we, we couldn't have done it any other way, um, in no, no pra practically sort of feasible way uh, that I can see uh, without, without WARF. And so, um, you know, WARF's been tremendously helpful in this whole process. Well, great. That's what we like to do here. We like to connect the great innovations at the university with the um, with uh, the world and get them applied in um, through our industry partners. So I'm going to ask one um, more question here, and I want to remind the audience you can submit questions through the Q and A. We'll go to an audience question um, after I just ask what people might be wondering is okay. So. We've got a very early stage technology, a patent application filed, and the roots of a collaboration with a local startup. And I know we all of this is um, very, very, very early right now, and we don't want to make any promises. But when do you think we might hear more about what's coming out of this collaboration? Um, I'll, I'll try and take a stab at that. You know, I. I <laughs> Shereen and David have their own perspectives on this. Um, you know, I, I think we have so much work ahead of us. This feels like very much day one. Um, you know, I, I kind of go to the quote, it's coming to my, my head, you know, the best way to sort of predict the future is to invent it. Um, but with oftentimes so many inventions, there's, it's just a winding um, road. And so I, uh, I don't want to, I don't want to overpromise. you know, we're, we're in the business of um, sort of a, uh, uh, over delivering under promising is what we like to say. Uh, and so, um, I'm going to, I'm going to probably defer to them, but I, to, to suffice to say, I think, I think it's, it's a, it's a month, if not years, uh, long road ahead. Um, you know, as soon as we have meaningful sort of information to share, we, we certainly will share it. Um, but, uh, yeah, we, we have a lot, a lot of work to, ahead of us. So I think that's a sufficiently vague answer that I would support. Uh, no, I mean, really it, it's hard to know. There's a lot of, there's a lot of things we have to you know, do to move this forward and, and really, you know, advance the technology and, and see what it can and can't do. Um, I would say that, you know, the COVID pandemic has created some challenges for doing uh, clinical research, uh, especially um, in um, healthy volunteers. It's very hard to, I think, justify recruiting healthy volunteers in the community to come into 
the sleep lab, you know, to do studies and those kinds of things. Um, but we've been very fortunate that we can continue some of the work that we're doing because the, we still have patients with clinical sleep disorders that we study in the sleep lab because they need care. And oftentimes, one of the things that's been really exciting is um, the work that we do often piggybacks on some of our clinical care. So we're actually able to study patients, obviously with their permission, uh, as part of these research studies, which is really exciting. And then also, um, Reed and I have gotten a, a grant um, uh, that's, uh, it's, I think it's in the works. I think I can say that's from the American Sleep Medicine Foundation to support some of the research around these, these issues too, and some of these discoveries. So we're really excited that we're going to be able to so hopefully merge different lines uh, of, of you know, you funding, support, uh, and collaboration to really try to move things things forward. So all looking looking bright, although the timetable still is a little bit to be determined. I'll just oh, go ahead, Reed. I was I was only going to add a little bit to that and just say that you know, um, aside from the vagueness, which is necessary because we really are at the early stages here, um, just to give people an idea. Um, it's really the plan is to basically take this for a test ride. And we need to do that in bigger populations. So we are going to spend the next year or two or three um, testing, those, testing how it works in these bigger populations and diverse populations. And we're going to have to refine it and we're going to have to tweak it and we're going to uh, continue to, to sort of reinvent this wheel. Um, but we believe we have real content here, and we believe with this process of testing it in these different populations, we'll be able to refine it into a, a working model that can be used in the next few years. That's all great. And I love to uh, David and Re. congratulations on the grant. And I think that also shows that working with a company going forward on an event on an invention doesn't preclude your normal academic progress either. And then, um, you know, the a usual research funding opportunities like um, David said that can all kind of converge and add to each other. So we just have a few minutes left. Uh, we do have a question from the audience um, from both the faculty researcher and industry perspective and your experiences. What ideas do you have to better connect university research with companies looking to solve problems? We said there was a bit of serendipity here in having good networks. That's very important. And that's something we're always trying to do at Wharf. And I'm sure Matt, as a company, you're always trying to expand um, your quality network. So you're aware of what's up. Do you guys have other ideas of, um, you know, that you could give to your colleagues as to how to better um, make those connections? Well, I, I would just say contact Wharf um, because it's really hard. I mean, as a, a researcher, you know, we're focused on, as David said, you know, writing grants, writing papers, you know, keeping our head down and focusing on the challenges that are directly in our either practices or in our, in our laboratories. Um, Wharf is great at um, helping you to basically extend that opportunity to find uh, perspective uh, uh, co collaborators. And um, so one thing with that David and I did is, is we met with them very early. Um, we had our preliminary data, but we met with them before we, did, you know, had any abstracts out there before we started writing the paper. And, and we just wanted to know what do we do next? And basically, they took us by the hand and they led us down um, down the aisle, if you will. So it's been a great um, experience, but that's that, that's the only thing I can think of is I would contact Wharf and, and let them help you. That's a wonderful note to end on. And I'll also mention that um, this, uh, com this question actually came from our colleagues on campus with Discovery to Product or D2P. Wharf is part of an innovation ecosystem here on the UW-Madison campus and within um, the whole city of Madison and the county of Dane as well. So there are others who can help you too. We might um, ask you to go elsewhere. We might um, introduce you to other people. So um, come into the ecosystem where you know people and we'll figure out where you should be to get the best help you can. Um, Laura, did you have a comment? 
Nope, nope. Okay, sorry. No, not at all. I misunderstood something. But with that, I want to thank David and Matt and Reed for joining us. And congratulations, David and Reed, on being finalists with the Wharf Innovation Awards. And at this point, I'll turn it over to Michael Falk, our Chief IP and Licensing Officer at Wharf, who will tell you about the other finalists as well as other honorees in innovation on the UW campus. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, team. Thank you, Jennifer. And what a, a great uh, technology they're working on. Such a nice group of people. That was just a really uh, enjoyable presentation. So thanks a lot for sharing that with us. Before we get to the Innovation Awards today, I'm pleased to be able to share some news about two select groups of UW-Madison innovators, including several Wharf inventors. First, we want to repeat the good news announced late last month that six UW-Madison faculty have been recognized as new fellows in the American Academy for the Advancement of Science. They are Laura Albert. She's a professor of industrial and systems engineering nominated for distinguished contributions to the application of operations research methodologies to public policy and for communicating her research to the public. Uh, second up is Alta Chero. Uh, Warren P. Knowles Professor of Law and Bioethics for her influential work on bioethics and public policy, including outstanding scholarship incorporating ideas and research from philosophy, law, biology, and the social and behavioral sciences. Next up is Patricia Kiley, Professor and Chair of Biomolecular Chemistry for distinguished contributions to understanding mechanisms that regulate E. coli's life strategy in different oxygen environments specifically how transcription factors exploit iron sulfur metal centers for oxygen responses. Bill Reznikoff, uh, Will, William Reznikoff, emeritus professor now at Marine Biological Laboratory. He's the Evelyn Mercer Professor of Biochemistry and nominated for deciphering the molecular details of transposition by studying a model bacteria transposon. William Tracy, Professor of Agronomy and Cliff Barr, an Organic Valley Chair in Plant Breeding for Organic Agriculture, for his role as a national leader in plant breeding and germplasm, and for training a generation of breeders while also communicating breeding's importance to the public. And finally, in this list is Ellen Zweil. She is the W.L. Crosser Professor of Astronomy and Physics for distinguished contributions to quantify the role of magnetic fields in shaping the cosmos on all scales. Congratulations to these remarkable scientists. Worf is especially proud to manage the inventions of professors Kylie, Tracy, and Reznikoff with the goal of applying their research results in the real world. It is also my pleasure to be able to announce that three UW-Madison faculty have been elected as fellows to the National Academy of Inventors. I begin with Charles Mistretta who is Emeritus Professor of Medical Physics, Radiology and Biomedical Engineering, and a renowned pioneer in medical imaging technology. His research on dual energy X-ray imaging led to the invention of digital subtraction and geography, a widely used imaging tool in radiology. He then developed TRIX, which stands for Time Resolved Imaging of Contrast Kinetics. And it's a three-dimensional imaging technique that takes the guesswork out of contrast enhanced MRI procedures. Dr. Mistretta holds more than 30 patents, five of which are currently active with a number of others still pending. These patents have earned almost $40 million in royalties since 1981. Next, we have Denise Ney. She is the Billings Baskin Professor of Nutritional Sciences and an internationally recognized expert on PKU, a rare inherited disorder that can cause intellectual disabilities. Her research uses a protein found in cheese whey called GMP to develop safer and more palatable medical foods that can treat PKU, as well as having a wide range of other uses for health and wellness. Professor Ney is an advisory board member for D2P, a Wharf Accelerator program participant, and holds two US patents, both of which have led to commercial agreements. And finally, Anne Palmenberg. She is the Roland Record Professor in the Department of Biochemistry and the Institute for Molecular Virology. She's an expert on the biology and biochemistry of RNA picornaviruses, the cause of many common colds. Her work sought 
of the solve the structure of the cold virus linked to childhood asthma, which attracted the interest of pharmaceutical companies and sparked new efforts to develop vaccines and antiviral treatments for asthma. Professor Palmenberg holds two patents as well as several forms of licensed biological materials. Congratulations to all those three. They're really remarkable inventors. And now I'm excited to introduce you, you, introduce you to the remaining five Wharf Innovation Award finalists. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the many people involved in selecting these finalists, including my team here. Wharf receives more than 350 new invention disclosures each year. Every disclosure is rigorously studied in terms of the patentability and its commercialization potential. Of those inventions that Wharf chooses to accept for patenting, our expert team evaluates each one for recognition as a Wharf Innovation Award finalist based on three criteria. Uh, the invention's potential for high long-term impact, whether the invention presents an exciting solution to a known important problem, and whether the invention could produce broad benefits for humankind. We ask a team of judges who have led distinguished careers as leaders in recognizing and advancing innovation to select the two winners. We'd like to thank this year's judges for their service. They are Lisa Johnson, CEO of BioForward, Fred Robertson, venture partner, Beard Capital, Sherry Ferens, she's an expert bonding engineer and a wharf catalyst, Paul Shane, president and CEO of SingleWire and a wharf catalyst alum, Hari Nair, vice president, corporate ID, Procter & Gamble, visiting scholar, Harvard School of Public Health and a wharf catalyst, and many of these have served uh, for many years and we really do appreciate their efforts in uh, serving as judges and all the other things they do to support WARF. Each of the two innovation award winners uh, that we'll announce shortly will receive $10,000 to split among the inventors. Pretty great. So now let's meet each of the WARF innovation award finalists. We've just heard from one and we'll hear from the next. This first finalist team embodies the kind of cross-disciplinary collaboration that promises to lead to breakthroughs in areas that present some of the most challenging problems confronting society. Let's hear about it first from Wharf IP manager, Leah Heyman and licensing director, Emily Bauer. Hi, I'm Leah Hammond, an intellectual property manager at Wharf. And I'm Emily Bauer. For this year's Wharf Innovation Awards, we're excited to nominate a cross-disciplinary team working to bridge synthetic biology and electronic communication. Professors Megan McLean and Bhuvna Krishnaswamy are developing next-generation biosensors with applications from healthcare diagnostics to environmental testing to food safety. Megan and Bhuvna, we are thrilled to recognize your team's ingenuity and we look forward to your next steps. My name is Meg McLean, and I'm an assistant professor in the Environmental Engineering Department. So there's been tremendous progress in the past decades in engineering sensors um, through synthetic biology and bioengineering to sense a variety of compounds that would be of interest in health in terms of sensing molecules that signal disease or in terms of sensing what's happening in the soil for better agricultural applications. But it's very difficult because cells themselves are not great processors to take that power and hook it to sort of things that would be traditionally useful. Yeah, so at the highest level, the goal of this technology is to allow biological sensing networks to communicate with electronic networks so that each can do what they're best at. So. Um, in biology, we have very good sensors for sensing molecules and other compounds of interest. And then we're very good at engineering electrical networks to perform computation and processing. So the idea is to allow them to talk to each other and each to do what they're best at. So on my end, my lab specializes in optogenetics, which we use to control the activity of these biosensors. And so we've engineered a number of optogenetic tools that allow us to control these sensors with light. So optogenetics takes advantage of naturally occurring light sensitive proteins and then engineers those proteins so that in response to light, they set off reactions or processes inside of a cell. So my contribution is in and leveraging the simplified bioelectronic network that we've developed and address a variety of these communication problems, how to read from these sensors and build a network of sensors to collect most amount of data 
most reliable data from such a network. We envision this in few years down the line to be incorporated in a wearable system that someone can wear um, an electronic, uh, a bioelectronic sensor where the sensor is on our body and we turn on it, our sensor with, uh, with the light and detect some activity on our skin or on our body uh, in real time. So that's where we see this uh, going in the future. Fantastic. Uh, next, we'll meet a research team whose innovation rests on a classic observation that they've looked at in a fresh way, and that has potential applications in fields as disparate as medical imaging and renewable energy. I'll turn it over to my colleagues, Janine Bermania and Stephanie Whitehorse to set the stage for this discovery. the Senior Director of IP Management and Licensing at WARF. And I'm Stephanie Whitehorse, Director of Intellectual Property for the Physical Sciences at WARF. We are pleased to nominate Professor Kerry Forrest and his team for this year's WARF Innovation Awards. Their system for generating fusion neutrons can make a significant impact in the production of medical imaging isotopes. It could also play a role in solving the critical challenge of nuclear waste remediation. Congratulations, Professor Forrest. We are excited to partner with you and your team on this cutting edge fusion technology. I'm Kerry Forrest. I'm a professor in the physics department. So in recent years, it's become clear that um, neutrons are extremely valuable both for, um, both for industrial purposes and academic uh, purposes and making neutrons is hard. Um, normally we would use nuclear power plants and reactors to produce neutrons, uh, but it would be great if we had smaller, more compact sources that could be moved around and um, were easier and cheaper to build. So we've invented a technique for making neutrons uh, with small compact devices uh, using an old uh, idea which is a magnetic mirror plasma trap to, um, to confine the, um, the fuel um, for nuclear fusion that makes neutrons. Yeah, so neutrons are, um, are useful for, for many, many things. Um, currently in Wisconsin, neutrons are being used to make medical isotopes. Um, the, um, there's an isotope of molybdenum, molybdenum 99, which is used in medical imaging. Neutrons are also could be used to burn up nuclear waste from, um, from fission reactors. So fission reactors produce waste. Uh, if we can make neutrons that have the right energy um, and enough of them, we could irradiate the waste um, that comes from um, nuclear reactors and um, incinerate it, make it go away so that it can be buried safely without a long-lived um, long effects. Um, we also hope to be able to use the same technology to actually build a nuclear fusion power reactor to make power. We've done the numerical modeling and theoretical modeling to show that it would work on paper and currently we're building a prototype of um, the reactor that will be used to demonstrate that the technology actually works. Terrific. UW-Madison has a long tradition and a global reputation as a leader in understanding cancer and pioneering treatments. Beth Werner and Andy Deteen from WARF will introduce a collaborative team with another important advance in this critical area of research. Hi, I'm Beth Warner, Director of Life Science Intellectual Property at WARF. And I'm Andy Detina, Director of Licensing. We're pleased to recognize the cancer immunotherapy work of Drs. Jenny Gumpers and Donna Bayou for this year's WARF Innovation Awards. By combining two kinds of cells found in the body, Jenny and Donna's work could open up a potentially transformative new approach to immune oncology, one that is faster and more specific than current methods. 
Congratulations to your great team, and we're very excited to follow the progress in the days to come. Hi, uh, my name is Jenny Dumperts. I'm a professor in the Department of Medical Microbiology and Immunology at UW-Madison. We all know that cancer is a tremendous problem in our society, and in recent years, there's been a lot of excitement about using the immune system to fight cancer. So the current ways that we do that have some problems associated with them, and those have to do with not always activating immune cells specifically enough, or in some cases, it's possible to generate immune cells that we actually grow in the lab and genetically modify and put back into patients to fight their cancers. And that's really very exciting, but the problem is that it takes a long time and a lot of cells and cancer patients just don't have a lot of time. Our invention involves taking a population of cells that we all have and preparing them ahead of time in the lab. Then we can conjugate those cells. We can join them to another kind of cell that's very specific and specifically activates T cells to kill tumors. These conjugates, these pairs of cells can be prepared ahead of time and stored so that when patients come in, ready for immunotherapy, they can be given these cells without delay. So our current stage is that we are testing our human cells in special animal models uh, where we can create a, a human cancer in the mice uh, and test our human cells uh, in those models. Uh, the next stage will be to move on to doing pilot clinical trials, and that will likely take uh, a few years. During my career, I worked in the fields of immunology and cell biology, and uh, my research focused uh, mainly on uh, basic research problems. Um, I'm really excited that uh, this research such a has such a high potential to be uh, translated into a clinical trial in the near future. Another signature area of expertise at UW-Madison is in stem cell research. Andy Deteen and Victoria Sutton from WARF introduce a remarkable research team on the cusp of bringing the promise of stem cell technology to reality for a number of game-changing applications. Hi, I'm Andy Deteen, a Director of Licensing at WARF. And I'm IP Manager Victoria Sutton. For the 2020 WARF Innovation Awards, we're excited to nominate Dr. Randolph Ashton and his team for their work developing improved stem cell-derived models of human neural tissue. This technology has tremendous potential. It provides a critical step towards bioengineering reproducible spinal cord and brain organoids with applications such as disease modeling, drug development, and regenerative medicine. Congratulations to Randy and his team. We're pleased to recognize your research in this vital area and look forward to your next steps. So my name is Randolph Ashton. I am an associate professor of biomedical engineering and I work over at the Wisconsin Institute for Discovery. I'm also the associate director for the UW-Madison Stem Cell Regenerative Medicine Center. For about a decade now, uh, scientists have been developing methods to culture human stem cells outside of the body, um, and they culture them as a spheroidal aggregate. Uh, and when you do that, the cells spontaneously start to differentiate and undergo processes that mimic early human development. And so they can start to create structures that look like uh, what we see in developing human brain, lung, and gut tissues, for example. And so our technology basically allows a, a very simple method uh, to control this development, particularly for generating models of the brain and spinal cord. And so very early in human development, uh, you form a tube-like structure, which we call the neural tube. And our technology allows us to essentially biomanufacture these neural tube-like structures um, at will. This will allow us to create models of the uh, human brain and spinal cord that are anatomically uh, similar to what we see in the developing human embryo and really will allow us to push the technology of creating these types of brain and, and, and 
and spinal cord models in a dish to the next level so that they really closely model uh, what normally forms in the human body. And that allows us to uh, be much more precise in the therapies we can develop uh, for the diseases that we can now model with these tissues. We would hope that this technology gets used broadly. Sometimes techniques like this are thought of as being niche because they're so hard to access, but they have such great utility for generating novel therapies that we think the easier this is to, to use, the more, the more potential we have to say, uh, affect human health outcomes in a positive manner. All right, and last, I'll have my colleagues Brian Froscher and Michael Curry introduce us to a collaborative team who has developed a method for tackling what may be the biggest challenge facing our planet, climate change. Hi, I'm Brian Freshour, IP Associate at WARF. And I'm Licensing Associate Michael Carey. For this year's WARF Innovation Awards, we're thrilled to nominate a team from the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. Inspired by climate change, Professor Bu Wong and Raghavendra Ragapani have developed a process that utilizes industrial waste such as coal ash for carbon capture and sequestration. Their process is greener with lower energy costs than other methods. Congratulations to your team. We're excited to partner with you as you work to address one of the greatest energy challenges of our time. Uh, hi, I'm Bu Wang. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. Um, the problem we try to solve is how to make carbon capture commercially viable. Um, so carbon capture is this process to remove carbon dioxide from air or from the emission stream such as flue gas from power plants. So it's an important part of the solution to the climate change issue caused by carbon emission. Uh, so particularly, if we can remove carbon dioxide from air, we can essentially turn the clock back, so to speak. However, the problem with the current carbon capture technology on the market is they use a lot of energy and therefore are very expensive to operate. So this technology is to capture carbon dioxide from air or from concentrated emission stream at minimal energy cost. The technology we are talking about is a multi-step process that involves a mineral carbonation step followed by carbon dioxide capture step. In the mineral carbonation step, we actually generate alkaline solution that can scrub carbon dioxide from air or from a point of source from the industry without the need for any pressurization and hence has very low energy intensity. So the technology what we are proposing uses an aqueous solution that is fully recyclable and it does not need any heat energy input or it does not need any pressurization uh, required. Hence the energy costs are low. The impact is mainly in addressing the climate change challenges and given the significant amounts of uh, alkaline industrial waste that are generated, uh, we believe the technology can be useful for many industries like power plants, steel plants, uh, even using recycled concrete. So the next step for us is to build a bench top scale demonstration unit. This will allow us to demonstrate technology, but also optimize our operating parameters. Uh, after that, we plan to conduct some preliminary market discovery and research, really figure out what our customers want to be and uh, our business model. All right, I always enjoy those videos so much. They're just so well done and really appreciate the uh, inventor community taking the time to communicate the science in that way. It's just, yeah, it's really terrific. All right, in addition to the invention we heard about at the start, we've got these five projects uh, and now the moment we've been waiting for. Uh, I'm happy to be able to announce two teams have won the 2020 Wharf Innovation Award. Uh, the first goes to Randolph Ashton, Gavin Knight, Benjamin Knutson, and Misa Iyer from Biomedical Engineering and the Wisconsin Institute for Discovery. 
for their invention of superior neural tissue models for disease modeling, drug development, and more. It's a terrific group. Congratulations, all of you. The second award goes to Jenny Gumpers and Donna Bayou for medical microbiology and immunology for their invention of a killer combination, multi-cell conjugates for activating antigen-specific T-cell responses. Another terrific group. Uh, and thank you. Uh, congratulations to those winners, of course, uh, well-deserved, uh, and to all the finalists. This is just uh, an exceptionally strong group of uh, inventors and inventions, and as you can see, uh, really a uh, terrific group of uh, uh, researchers and something the campus can be proud of. You'll find a recording of today's session at WARF's website, WARF.org, and there will be news about these adventure groups coming out in uh, Inside UW, so look for that. I uh, really want to thank everyone for participating in this. Thank you for uh, joining us to celebrate uh, these innovators, uh, and best wishes for you in the holiday season, and uh, to stay safe and sound. Thank you so much.